Hey guys, just before we get into the video today, I do want to give a quick plug for another channel I do. It's a new one. You probably haven't heard of it. It's called Business Blaze. It's a business channel, but that would not be describing it accurately. If you like all of the kind of sillier and funnier moments from this channel, that channel is kind of more about that. So you get the facts, but it's also much more off script. Here is a five second clip. Can you imagine like working for like the Department of Defense or whatever? And it's like, we've got this huge medical problem. People's feet are rotting off in the trenches and it's like what's his face edgar's like yeah yeah i'll fix that i'm gonna go invent something for that <laughs> he comes back like a month later and he's like gentlemen i present to you the water bomb he had utterly failed in his mission to find a prevention for trench foot but he immediately became inspired to invent water balloon toys for children which sounds like loads more fun i'm sure he didn't to all the people in the trenches who are like my feet <laughs> But my feet, Edgar! If you like that, if you think you'd like more of that, please do consider subscribing. It's a really different thing from me, so don't expect it to be exactly like this. But if you think you could like things that are a bit sillier, but with facts as well, please do check out Business Blaze. It is linked to below. And here's today's video. Move over, Mr. Ed. Clever Hands was the original horse who could communicate with humans in complex ways. Well, at least it seemed that way at the time. This phenomenon began in the late 19th century with a German mathematics teacher by the name of Wilhelm von Osten. He was a student of phrenology, which meant he adhered to the belief that a person's intelligence, among other things, can be determined by the size and shape of their head. In addition, he was interested in animal intelligence and the idea that it was great underestimated by the human race. As a result of his beliefs, von Austin decided to attempt to teach three different animals, a cat, a bear, and a horse named Hans. The first two didn't turn out so well, but at least he managed to escape being mauled by the bear. To his delight, though, the horse did seem to respond to von Austin's mathematical tutelage. It began with Hans simply tapping out numbers written on a blackboard. Any number under 10 he could count by tapping one of his hooves. Von Austin was excited and encouraged by this progress and decided to test the horse further. He began writing out basic mathematical problems and attempting to train Hans to recognize simple symbols. This proved relatively easy for the animal, and before long he was able to provide correct answers to a myriad of problems, including fractions, square roots, and multiplication. Von Austin decided to take Hans on the road, and in 1891 he was performing free shows all over Germany. By this stage, Hans was able to spell out names with his taps, as well as tell the time and work out dates. Despite the fact that his accuracy wasn't 100%, Hans's abilities were impressive enough to draw large crowds, as well as attract the attention of skeptics such as representatives from the New York Times who ran a front-page story about the horse, as well as Germany's Board of Education. The latter decided that they wanted to investigate Hans's abilities, which von Austin readily agreed to. After all, he knew that he was no fraudster and there was no scandal to be exposed. The investigation team became known as the Hans Commission, and it was comprised of a variety of men from differing professions. These included a psychologist, a few school teachers, a circus manager, two zoologists, and a horse trainer. Despite thorough investigation and testing, the commission concluded in 1904 that there was nothing fraudulent about Hans's abilities and that he really was a gifted horse. Despite their findings, a psychologist by the name of Oskar Funkst remained skeptical about Hans and his supposed abilities. With the permission of von Austin, he picked up where the Hans Commission left off and embarked on some thorough and unique investigation techniques. Firstly, he had a tent erected in which the experiments would take place. The primary purpose of this was to shield the investigation and Hans himself from outside distraction and contamination. He then made a large list of questions to ask Hans as well as the variables that could affect the outcome. Come. At first, Hans reacted to the questioning as normal, at least when his owner asked the questions. However, things began to change when Funkst began to change certain environmental factors during the questioning. For instance, he asked von Austin to stand further away when asking Hans questions. The horse's accuracy it diminished, though nobody was really sure why. As a result, the psychologist decided to try some other variables. Von Austin was instructed to ask Hans questions that he himself didn't know the answer to, and immediately Hans's accuracy went from being roughly 89% correct to almost zero. The same results would also occur if Hans was questioned from behind a concealing screen. It seemed that to answer questions, Hans needed to have a clear view of his questioner, who incidentally had to know the answer to the question himself. The obvious conclusion would be that von Austin had trained Hans to respond to previously prepared questions, but why then would he so readily agree to the investigation? 
To answer this question, Funks decided to continue his studies, but to switch his focus to those who were questioning and interacting with the horse. He almost instantaneously noticed certain shifts in the posture, facial expressions, and breathing of the questioners whenever Hans tapped his hoof. With every tap, their tension seemed to increase. When the correct answer had been reached, it would disappear. Funks thus concluded that Hans was taking these subtle shifts in tension as his cue to stop. This tension it didn't exist when the questioner was was unaware of the answer to his own question, which explains why Hans had no idea what to do in that circumstance. The most fascinating part of this was that both Von Austen and any other questioner involved had absolutely no idea that they were giving Hans clues. It was all completely unconsciously done. To further prove his point, Funkst himself took on the role of Hans and attempted to answer questions based purely off body language. By carefully watching his questioners, he was successful in this test even when they were aware of these cues. It seems they simply weren't able to stop themselves from displaying them. Since then, displays of unintentional cues have become known as the Clever Hans Effect. Despite the fact that Funks's investigation proved Clever Hans to be something of a hoax, he did inadvertently prove Von Austin's own hypothesis surrounding the intelligence of animals. Sure, Hans couldn't really do semi-complex maths or tell you the time without a little help, but he was incredibly receptive to extremely subtle human body language. It may not be the intellect that Von Austin was going for, but it is, nonetheless, rather impressive. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of intelligent animals, none other than Dick Van Dyke was once saved by porpoises when he found himself lost at sea on a surfboard. So, well, what's the story here? In his younger years, Van Dyke frequently spent time surfing. In an appearance on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, Van Dyke briefly mentioned one such time that he was surfing using a 10-foot-long board. Said Dick, Went out once and fell asleep on the board, and woke up out of sight of land, and I looked around and started paddling with the swells, and I start seeing fins swimming around me, and I thought, well, I'm dead. They turned out to be porpoises, and they pushed me all the way to shore. I'm not kidding. Remarkably, Ferguson didn't have Van Dyke elaborate on this incredible tale, and instead, immediately after Van Dyke uttered this, proceeded to make a few slightly less than humorous jokes, and then he used the remaining time in the segment to have Van Dyke play a harmonica. And we should also note here that Dick Van Dyke does not actually know how to play a harmonica. So unfortunately, we can't give any further details, like when it happens. Would we have missed out on his wonderful performances in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Mary Poppins had the porpoises not helped him out? Or was this after the fact? How far out did he estimate he was after they pushed him back to shore? Were they really porpoises? Or was Dick Van Dyke simply making the common slip of thinking dolphins are porpoises and vice versa? Also, we have no idea where he was surfing at the time. In any event, for the curious, you can tell the difference between a porpoise and a dolphin on sight in a few different ways. First, porpoises have much shorter snouts that are also fairly flat at the ends and easily distinguished from dolphin snouts. Less obvious at first glance is that their teeth have more of a spade shape than the conical shape of dolphin teeth. Porpoises also tend to be smaller than most types of dolphin. Going back to sea life rescues, a man, Ronnie DeBal, was once saved by dolphins after having his fishing boat capsized during a storm. At the time, he was out of sight of land, and once his boat sunk, he grabbed onto some styrofoam to stay afloat. Eventually, a group of about 30 dolphins came along and took turns nudging him towards land for several hours until he finally ended up exhausted on a beach about 24 hours after his boat sank. In another instance, on October 30, 2004 in New Zealand, a pot of seven bottlenose dolphins rescued a group of young lifeguards, members of the Vongarai Head Surf Life Saving Club from a great white shark. The dolphins first began acting strange, tightly circling and slapping the water next to the people, eventually herding them into a close group. It was then that one of the older lifeguards, Rob Howes, noticed the 9 to 10 foot great white shark swimming very close to them, being kept at bay by the dolphins. This encounter lasted a full 40 minutes, with the dolphins successfully fending off the shark and no one getting hurt. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And as always, thank you for watching.